On November 4th, 2008, the people of California voted to fund this, a high-speed rail line. Many countries around the world have had high-speed trains for decades, and this would be the U.S.'s attempt to finally catch up. The train would whisk passengers from L.A. to San Francisco in under three hours, and it was all set to open in 2020. Today, it's 2022, and California's high-speed rail project is famous for being a disaster. Will be the most expensive project in state history. A train that's going to nowhere. Train to nowhere. All that's there today is this one section, still under construction from Bakersfield to Merced. But the failure of this rail line isn't just California's problem. It's an ominous sign for big projects all over the U.S. We see other advanced economies all around the world that are able to do this. So they can do it, so why can't we? In other words, what is it about the U.S. that made California's high-speed rail line so hard to build? Just to be clear, this was a pretty good idea. A lot of people travel between San Francisco and L.A., but the trip takes at least six hours by car. It's less than an hour by plane, but that's not counting time in two of the country's busiest airports. So a two-hour and 40-minute trip by high-speed rail made sense. California just needed to design a route that connected its big cities efficiently. It's really about population density and how quickly you can serve areas of high population density. This is Ethan Elkind, director for the climate program at UC Berkeley Law School and host of the local State of the Bay radio show. You really want those centers where there's a lot of people working and living within a few kilometer range of, of the station. If you don't have that, then it's not worth a high-speed rail stop. But that's easier said than done. In the early 2000s, the California High-Speed Rail Authority considered two routes in Southern California. This one went straight up the I-5 highway, while this one looped eastward and stopped in Palmdale. It was 34 miles longer, and studies estimated it would be 12 minutes slower. Yet, ultimately, this was the route they chose. So what happened? So the Palmdale stop was really added at the behest of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors that wanted to see a stop for high-speed rail in Palmdale. If you have the county uh, that the high-speed rail line is going through opposing it, that can create real political problems, can create litigation problems, can create permitting problems. Palmdale politicians understandably wanted the train's riders and business opportunities to come to their district. The problem was that they had the power to hold up the entire project to do so. They have this power because the U.S. government gives it to them. The U.S. is a federal system, meaning power is divided between the federal government and state governments, which in turn grants some power to local governments. When it comes to infrastructure, a lot of the power and responsibility is often on this local level. That's the compromise that we make here in the United States. We believe in local control to some extent, uh, you know, representative uh, democracy. The downside of that is when you're trying to get a project at this scale built, you know, it does take a lot of compromise. And in order to build a 1,300 kilometer high-speed rail line, the state high-speed rail authority had to compromise with a lot of local governments. In the Bay Area, politicians pushed for this route instead of this one, even though it was much more expensive and slower for travelers coming from San Francisco. And in the Central Valley, the route stops in all these cities instead of going up this faster route in order to ensure support from the politicians here. All of these little compromises began adding up, making the route slower and more expensive, which was a problem because the funding was already on shaky ground. When California voted in 2008, the state estimated it would need $33 billion to complete by 2020. But voters were told that California taxpayers would only have to pay $9 billion. That's because the planners were counting on the federal government to chip in $12 to $16 billion. And it made some sense. The federal government spends tens of billions of dollars a year on transportation infrastructure. The problem was only a fraction of it goes to trains. Partly because unlike most countries with high-speed rail, the U.S. has a stark political divide on whether we even need it. By 2010, the Democrat-controlled Congress had allocated just over $3 billion for the project. Not nothing, but not nearly as much as the state wanted. But by 2015, the Democrats had lost control of Congress to the Republicans, who opposed this kind of mass transit project. More money for California's high-speed rail, I call it high-cost rail, is a terrible idea. None of these funds can be used for high-speed rail. They made it very difficult for any further federal money to reach this project, leaving it well short of funding. It's an example of how, in the U.S., long-term projects can be at the mercy of whichever party is in power. 
since they often have the power to stall it at any time. And it's not just the federal government. Private citizens can also hold things up. It took less than a year for people to start suing the California High Speed Rail Project. Many cases were based on a law called the California Environmental Equality Act, known as CEQA. CEQA requires the government to study the environmental effects of any government project, explore alternatives, and release the findings in a report. It's very easy to find a hole in that assessment and then file a lawsuit, essentially target practice for lawyers. Many of these lawsuits had legitimate concerns. Some farmers in the Central Valley worried about the train damaging their agricultural land, irrigation systems, and crops. But others simply used CEQA to try and keep the project from being built in their neighborhood. This is a common way in the U.S. for private citizens to block important projects like housing or infrastructure. It's not cheap to bring a CEQA lawsuit. Sometimes you've got very powerful homeowners groups that have sued and forced changes, or at least delayed the project and run up costs. For the high-speed rail line, these lawsuits were like roadblocks. And in order to clear them, the state had to hire legions of expensive lawyers, which added time and costs. I think you do want to have a participatory system. You do want to have people able to, to say their piece, and you want policymakers to respond, just that you don't want to get to the point where a hyper-local interest has veto over a project of really statewide importance. But take away local politicians and federal drama and lawsuits, and this project still would have faced problems. The state body in charge of designing and managing this project was the California High-Speed Rail Authority. There was just one problem. The High-Speed Rail Authority had never built anything like this. Whoops. Obviously, it's a tried and true technology globally, but it was new in North America when California tried it. Certainly, we didn't have the confidence in-house how to build it here. When Japan and France were building their high-speed rail networks, they had legions of experienced engineers inside their governments. But the California High-Speed Rail Authority had to hire consultants and contractors to handle the design and construction. These consultants were four times the cost, in some cases, of what it would have cost to hire someone just to do it in-house. Another reason why the authority had to keep increasing the estimated cost of the project, which today is up to $113 billion to complete the whole line. But the state only has enough money to build this section in the rural Central Valley. Even if it can get the rest, it would probably take a few more decades to finish this project. The high-speed rail is a cautionary tale for really big transformative projects in the U.S. We need all sorts of rail transit, bus lanes, new renewable energy facilities, all the things we need to do to, to have a more sustainable and vibrant economy. But the U.S. is falling further and further behind its peers because the political compromises, underfunding, lawsuits, and extra costs that hampered California's high-speed rail can also happen to any other big project the U.S. takes on. 